Hi, I'm Lauren Bennett. I'm a product engineer on the spatial analysis team, and I'm here to answer 10 questions for Esri about, you guessed it, spatial analysis. So let's get started. We have a question here from Hassan A. And the question is, what is spatial analysis? At its core, spatial analysis is really about understanding our world, making sense of where things are, how they relate, what it all means, uh, and what actions to take using that information that we've gained through spatial analysis. Um, it can range from simple visual analysis, understanding where things are, literally just putting our data on a map is a form of spatial analysis. Um, can be about measuring the size, shape, and distribution of our data. Things like how long is a river, how tall is a building, how big is an agricultural field that I'm monitoring. Um, it can be about determining how places are related. I think about this kind of like the bread and butter of GIS. It's about overlaying things and, and understanding how things overlap. Um, it can also be about finding the best location or path. So what's the best route to get from point A to point B, whether it's on a road network or along terrain, um, citing the best location for a new store based on all sorts of factors like demographics or competition. Um, one of my favorite ways to use spatial analysis is about detecting and quantifying patterns. So this is finding hotspots or outliers of disease or crime. Um, it can be about uh, seeing how patterns are changing over time, which is a really important aspect of, of really all kinds of spatial analysis is to see change over time and trends over time. Spatial analysis really runs um, through so many different industries and fields, and it's really at its core about understanding um, our world and turning data into information so that we can use that information to make better decisions. The next question is from Mihail C. What is the best type of data to use for spatial analysis? Vector data or raster data? Actually, in the real world, most of the time, we're going to find ourselves using both raster and vector data to solve the complex problems that we face. Certainly, if you have um, a phenomenon that is continuous in nature, you're probably going to be modeling that data using a raster format. And if your data is discrete in nature, you're probably going to be modeling your data in a vector format. But the truth is that most of the problems that we're trying to solve are going to involve bringing those different kinds of data together. And one of the, the great things about ArcGIS is that you really aren't limited to making a decision about that up front. Um, ArcGIS is really great at integrating raster data and vector data together and doing spatial analysis on both kinds of data, all um, kind of in one place, using the same kinds of tools uh, so that you can solve the, the problem that you, that you need to solve. So I think with, with most analysis, the most important thing that we do is up front really figuring out what our question is, and that'll guide the whole process, including what kinds of data formats you're going to need to think about. The next question is from Dan P. Uh, the question is, what multidimensional data formats do you see being directly supported within the tools of ArcGIS Pro? Multidimensional data formats are used to store a lot of scientific data um, that's either multidimensional in terms of, of space, thinking about things like elevation, um, but also in terms of being multivariate and also temporal, and oftentimes all of those things at the same time. And that scientific data often takes the form of HDF, GRIB, and NetCDF. Um, as of the 10.3 release, you can actually do a lot right out of the box with all three of those formats, taking advantage of the Mosaic data set, which allows you not just to visualize your data, but also to do a lot of kinds of spatial analysis, lots of raster analytic functions, work against those mosaic data sets, and allow you to access your HDF GRIB and NetCDF data. Also, already in the software, software right now, um, we're using NetCDF as a format to store what we call a space-time cube, which allows you to aggregate um, incident kind of point data 
into spatial and temporal bins and then do some really powerful space-time analytics against that net CDF file or that space-time cube. Now in the future, we're really excited about a lot of work that's being done to essentially make it easier to access that data and visualize that data um, that's multidimensional and multivariate, uh, essentially kind of a raster hypercube. And we're really excited about the work that we're, we're doing to expose that from an exploration standpoint, from a visualization standpoint, um, and absolutely from an analytical standpoint. So I would say kind of stay tuned because that is a, a big initiative for us and a place that you're going to see incremental improvements um, as well as some, some major releases coming up pretty soon. So our next question is actually from Dan P. again. He had two really good ones, so we included them both. Um, this one is, why aren't there more tools for exploring relationships or associations between variables before the spatial dimension is introduced? This is actually one of the big reasons that we include SciPy with ArcGIS. Not only so that we can take advantage of the valuable algorithms and scientific com computing that's part of SciPy, but also so that you can. We're also working really hard to extend our, our visualization capabilities. And that started with charting in um, ArcGIS Pro 1.2. So you can do things like explore relationships using scatter plots or understand the distribution of your data using histograms. Um, and we're constantly working to improve those charting capabilities, extend the way that you can interact with your data um, and make sense of it because we know that being able to visually explore your data is a critical part of the spatial analysis process and is absolutely something that will continue to grow as we grow our GIS Pro. Our next question is from Eric S. He asked, what's the best way to determine a search radius for density analysis if not using the default? Is there a better way than just guessing? Well, the default search radius for kernel density as of 10.2.1 is actually something really cool. It's a spatial um, adaptation of something called Silverman's Rule. So what it does is it actually takes into account the spatial configuration of your data, the number of points they are analyzing. It even takes into account if you've got some spatial outliers, and it chooses a default search radius that way. That said, the best way to choose the default or to choose a, a search radius is actually not to accept the default and probably not to guess, um, but to really think about what your question is. So for instance, if you're analyzing crime and you know that you're going to remediate based on police beats, you might use the size of a, your average police beat as your search radius because that is the scale at which you're going to remediate. Now a lot of times choosing a search radius that's really specific to your question means having to have quite a bit of uh, subject matter expertise. So a really good way to think about doing this is to team up with some folks within your organization that are actually going to use the results of your analysis to make some decisions. And together, as a, as a group or as a team, you can come up with the best possible answer for what the search radius is for your particular question. And I think just to remember that there isn't a right or a wrong search radius. It's really just about um, thinking about the problem that you're trying to solve um, and using that, that subject matter expertise. Our next question is from Francesco T. He wants to know, can I implement a custom Python script that calls external R or C++ routines and publish it as a GP service without breaking it? The short answer is definitely. Um, all that it really takes to make sure that the, the script that you publish as a geoprocessing service is going to work once it's published is to make sure that anything that that Python script's accessing is available on the machine where you're publishing it. So let's say you build a really awesome Python script on your laptop and you get it all working because you've got the C++ on your machine and you've got R installed on your machine and then you go to publish it and you put it on the server. All you have to do is make sure if you had R installed on this machine and that Python script's using it, that it's installed on the server. You need to make sure that any C++ calls are gonna be accessible from that server and then everything will just work. The next question is from Yuri V. 
I would like to know if there's a GIS web platform that includes editing tools and could perform some simple spatial analysis like buffer, union, intersect, etc. ArcGIS Online. Um, ArcGIS Online has tons of spatial analysis capabilities from the simple stuff like buffers and overlays, but actually quite a few more advanced analytical tools like um, prediction using empirical Bayesian Krieging um, and pattern analysis like the Find Hotspots tool. Um, there's also quite a bit of network analysis functionality, so you can choose a best facility, which under the hood is using location allocation. Um, and you can plan routes, and that's not just um, single vehicle routes, but you can actually route an entire fleet of vehicles through ArcGIS Online, which is uh, pretty amazing if you ask me. As far as editing is concerned, there is some editing that you can do in ArcGIS Online. You can make any of your services editable, and that allows you to at the creating data right inside of ArcGIS Online, essentially using hosted services um, and making them access accessible across the world to be edited, which is really powerful. Um, if you want a little bit more fine grain editing capabilities, you could even build your own applications using the JavaScript API and ArcGIS server, taking advantage of feature services and geometry services to really get in there and choose exactly how you want to allow people to edit data. Um, there's also something called the Web App Builder for ArcGIS which exposes some of those same widgets that are, that are accessible through ArcGIS Online, so the analysis widgets. There's also an editing widget um, that allows you to really expose just the pieces of functionality that you want your end users to have access to um, in an application really just without writing any code, just using this simple builder experience and exposing that um, to your end users. The next question we got from quite a few people wanting to know what Esri is doing to deal with big data. Can ArcGIS handle billions of features or terabytes of data? Now, the ArcGIS 10.5 release is going to be huge when it comes to big data and the kind of distributed computing that really makes big data fly for spatial analysis. Um, it's going to involve functionality that will allow you to analyze not just um, massive tabular data, but also massive feature data and massive raster data. Uh, it's an initiative that we, we call GeoAnalytics. And GeoAnalytics is really all about um, allowing you to run spatial analysis as a set of distributed processes that are scaled um, across a cluster of machines that allow you to, I think about it as kind of whittling our data down into what's really important. Um, it also allows us to aggregate data and do really common kind of spatial analysis um, uh, types like find hotspots, for instance, or you can buffer. And this is at a massive scale across clusters of machines um, to really make sense of the kind of big data that we know organizations all over the world are, are dealing with. The next question is from Robert S. He wants to know, when are we getting a Poisson regression model? This is a really good question because we get asked all the time when we're going to implement a specific workflow or tool in ArcGIS. Um, the Spatial Statistics Toolbox already has um, an ordinary least scores regression method implemented, and we've got a geographically weighted regression, which allows you to kind of bring geography into the mix and, and do some really powerful analysis. Um, but certainly, we know that you might want to do a Poisson regression. And this is really one of the big reasons that we've been working really hard and we're really excited about a new um, project that we've been working on that is called the R Bridge. Now R is a wildly popular open source statistical pa package that people use um, to do all sorts of, of analysis. And the R bridge was built to allow ArcGIS users to run R functionality right inside of ArcGIS and take advantage of the visualization capabilities of ArcGIS, um, the data management capabilities of ArcGIS, but still use R functionality under the hood of their geoprocessing tools. Um, it was also built to empower our users to 
access ArcGIS functionality and, and access specifically ArcGIS data from right inside of R. So if you want to do a Poisson regression, you can do it right inside of ArcGIS, taking advantage of R, um, and it all happens kind of seamlessly, seamlessly using the R bridge. So our next question is from John G. He wants to know what's new in spatial analysis and what's coming. We just released in the last year or so uh, some new tools to do space-time pattern mining that allow you to make sense of your data not just spatially but temporally and find clusters, find outliers. Um, so we're really excited about those tools and, and the work that we're doing moving forward with that. Um, there's also a new tool called EBK regression prediction, which is incredibly powerful, allows you to bring a lot of data together to make incredibly accurate predictions um, by using this kind of multivariate approach to Krieging um, and to that kind of prediction analysis. So we're really excited about EBK regression prediction as well. And when it comes to um, the future, we're busy working on uh, a new tool that's going to allow you to calculate rates inside of a space-time cube, essentially normalizing data. So instead of just looking at space-time patterns of crime, you could look at space-time patterns of crime per capita, which is really powerful, opens up a whole new kind of set of questions that you can ask and answer. Um, we're also making a lot of our tools 3D. So now if your input point data is 3D um, and you run standard create standard deviational ellipses, you're going to get an ellipsoid back, a 3D ellipsoid, which opens up those kinds of measuring geographic distributions tools to all sorts of applications underground, in the oceans, in the air. Um, so lots of applications there um, that we're really, really excited about. We're also going to be um, exposing some new capabilities for creating hexagons inside of ArcGIS. Um, and you can create a space-time cube using hexagons. And you can also run optimized hotspot analysis using hexagons, um, which is really great because hexagons have a, a lot of properties that make them ideal for certain types of analysis. And also, they're visually very beautiful. Um, so we're excited about those capabilities as well. But there's, I mean, that's scratching the surface. There's so much more that we've been working on. Um, there's web-based point cloud streaming. There's interactive editing of last data files. There's enhanced suitability modeling, improved performance for raster functions, enhancements to the EBK regression prediction tools, um, new chart types and ways to interact with your chart data by taking advantage of the time slider and the range slider. Um, all to explore your data in new ways. Um, there's vertical projections and transformations that are coming, um, a new way to manage uh, Python packages and environments called Conda, which we're really excited about, and of course, the new tools for dealing with big data um, and distributed analysis. Thanks so much for contributing to 10 Questions for Esri. And don't forget to subscribe to the Esri YouTube channel and to join the conversation on GeoNet.